uh, digitally and physically, my email is anthony at starfish.network or come see me in person after I finish speaking. Thank you. With that, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Matthew or Travis. Oh, I got it. Okay, cool. Hey everyone, thanks so much for coming out. We like to do these once a month, various topics. And, uh, oh, if you go to... All right, sorry, some last minute streaming issues. And in fact, if you're on the live stream, we'll probably be cutting off this whole beginning part while we're trying to get the audio working. <laughs> but it should be all fine. We're also recording it, so we'll upload that later if there's any, any issue. So something we like to do here is at the very beginning, give people in the community a chance to kind of like talk up real quick, say, hey, I'm working on X, talk to me about Y. Uh, we call them lightning talks. This predates the lightning network, the name. Uh, I believe uh, Fode wanted to say something. If there's anybody else who's interested, now would be a good time. Are you still? Still interested? All right. And if you're interested, just come right over here. We'll just do like a couple of them. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Fode, and I'm a local uh, developer and a computer science student. And uh, we are running a, a new meetup, a new meetup series uh, starting uh, this Saturday, uh, Saturday, April 13th, so about two weeks from now. And we want to basically share, um, or should I say, uh, we want to uh, uh, not teach but learn how to program Bitcoin from scratch, as a matter of fact. So we have like a reading group uh, for Jimmy Song's uh, programming Bitcoin, and it's gonna start on uh, April 13th, between 11 o'clock to about one o'clock in the afternoon. And it's read, uh, led by myself and uh, also uh, Casey Bowman. And we want to just uh, get some Bitcoin programming knowledge out there. So if you have some basics of uh, mathematics, a little bit of basics of Python uh, programming, we invite you to come through and maybe help us maybe uh, get off the ground and uh, start teaching how to, learning how to program Bitcoin from scratch. Great. I, I am really excited about that event. Uh, that's really cool. We also, uh, if you go on the, the, uh, the uh, meetup page, there's another educational group we started recently, uh, Ethereum Project Working Group. Just people who get together to work on Ethereum projects, but the idea that it's more than just Solidity, uh, there's MetaMask and Web App, and, and so it's kind of like covering all those questions. Uh, next up, June. Just real quick, my name is June. I'm one of the organizers of the uh, Crypto World Expo. Uh, it's a, it's going to be a great event where people are going to demo their apps or their platforms. Uh, it's in San Francisco, April 13 and 14. Again, it's called Crypto World Expo. It's cwexpo.co. Uh, so I'm one of the organizers. Justin in the back is uh, another organizer. So if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to answer any questions. But uh, save that day. It's a weekend, Saturday, Sunday, April 13 and 14. Thanks, guys. Oh, one more. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin from NeuronPoint.com, and I have a startup that basically aggregated data from all the major exchanges. So if you're building a app that needs to have the infrastructure connect to about 40 plus major exchanges, real-time data or aggregating your users uh, account balances and stuff to make some any creative app like uh, something for competitor shapeshift tax accounting stuff you name it uh, we have the tools to help you and right now it's free so and trading too you know you want to do market making to support your coin after ICO whatever so neuronpoint.com please check us out or talk to me after this Okay. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Matt. Um, Matt's working, works as a co-founder of BlockCypher. I'm really excited to have them out here because obviously Grin has a lot of uh, really interesting applications for, for blockchain technology in the future, but there's not a whole lot of companies necessarily working on it yet, but, but BlockCypher is. They ran, they got the first U.S. mining pool, very involved. So uh, if you want to know anything about Grin, this is, this is the guy to ask. So please, big round of applause. Thank you. Um, so my name is Mathieu Rieu. I'm the co-founder of um, BlockCypher. Um, BlockCypher has been around since 2014. So we've been around for a while. Um, we were a platform. So we help like, people like maybe you build applications. Um, and we offer APIs so that we can consume, consume them really easily. We support Bitcoin, Litecoin, uh, Dogecoin, Dash, and Ethereum. Um, 
but here I'm less, well, I'm less here today to talk about that, but more about green mains. So we just released the mining pool, well, just a month, two months ago, uh, which is a green mining pool. So we see it a bit as a continuation of, you know, building platforms. Um, mining pool are just platforms for miners. It's just the most specialized protocol, which was the same thing. It's the same way as API for the most part. Uh, and we started that, well, I said a couple of months ago, it's been working pretty well with the first sort of, you know, Western mining pools, kind of hard to compete with the like of BTC.com and F2Pool, um, but we're trying. Um, and so today, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about mostly green, uh, but being a green mining pool, we're fairly interested in mining. Um, and so if you have a, you know, a graphic card, if you're a gamer, you know, play in the evening or whatever, but the whole night your computer is not working, probably the whole morning. Um, so you can mine, you know, run the, the green software is actually, there's multiple types of software to mine. They're all fairly easy to use. Um, and so you can try pointing to green mint and um, see how that works. Uh, it's, you know, kind of cool to get a few grains out of your uh, already paid rig anyway. Um, so yeah, that's actually my co-founder's um, boy. Um, he built his own computer and he made a whole YouTube video, so I said I would show it. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, the, the title is Win 101, so I'm gonna sort of um, start sort of higher level, you know, if you've never heard of Win before, what it is, kind of what's the ID, what the, the project sort of how it works and then go a little more technical and toward the end we'll just run back up. Um, so yeah, the project. Sorry, I don't have the mirror, so I'll look back a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of history. Um, there's sort of the standard stuff that you've been used to. It's 100% open source, uh, but compared to other projects, it's entirely community driven. Um, there's no, you know, single company that uh, drives the whole thing. Uh, it's mostly funded by donations. Uh, it's written in Rust, so um, I don't know what the ratio of these are developers versus not, but it's a little more safe than say C++, where you can always, you know, trip over yourself uh, fairly frequently. Um, so the project has been announced, um, yeah, in 2016. It was the first Mimbo Wimble implementation, so I'll run into Mimbo Wimble and what it is and things like that after. That's kind of a short timeline of all the, the whole development. I don't know, maybe you've seen that before. So it was announced uh, in 2016 as a Tor um, link, so anonymized link, uh, dropped on an RSC channel by somebody whose pseudonym was Thomas de Dizor, which I can tell you being French. Um, he uh, is the name of, well, so the alias for Voldemort in the French Harry Potter book. So in English, I think it's Tom Riddle. Um, and Tom Romolo Riddle, Riddle, I think, something like that, which stands for I am Voldemort when you, it's an anagram. So in French, of course, it has to stand for Je suis Voldemort and not I am Voldemort. Um, and so the full name is, <laughs> yes, exactly, Tom Elvis de which is the, so maybe it's French, I don't know or she's French. Um, and then, so it was, the paper describes um, a blockchain format and that's about it. So it just described, you know, what a blockchain should look like and good things about it and how it can behave better. And I'll, I'll show you more about that. Uh, so from there, you know, people like picked up the paper and started refining it. Andrew Polstra was working on, I think something similar. And so they were sort of, uh, they've been increment on that idea. And then the first uh, implementation was posted in October 2016 by the, another character called Ignotus Peverell. So if you're uh, still on the Harry Potter sort of, um, Ignotus Peverell was the first person to get the cape that Harry Potter uses to um, hide all the time, uh, the invisibility cloak. And then um, lots of work continued and then it was released mid uh, January just a couple months ago. Um, so a common question might be like, why, you know, wait another? Why not use, you know, build on Bitcoin or 
use Ethereum or whatever it is that you like. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, reasons that Bitcoin is hard to build on, and there are ideas in Mimbo Wimbo actually where if you want to do it elegantly enough, you kind of have to, um, well, you can't really, like, you know, build incrementally. incrementally. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot of innovation in there that are kind of interesting. So that's the, uh, I don't want to force you to read everything, but that's um, the README um, of Grin. Um, it's some, well, a little happy at the beginning, but uh, it kind of re uh, reveals a bit that, you know, the, um, the overall approach is very um, collaborative and open, I guess. Um, and then those are um, value propositions that have been cited uh, pretty often. Um, so with privacy, um, design is minimal, which, um, so I, we at BlockCypher power uh, other blockchains. So we run, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, all of that. And um, the complexity actually since, um, since we started in this space has only been going up. Uh, projects get more and more complex, so you get, I don't know, you can start with Bitcoin, which is not, it's somewhat complex, but not super complex. Then you go Ethereum, which is a fair amount more complex. And then you go say Tezos, which is a lot more complex. Um, and so it's kind of nice to see, you know, a project going a little bit back to the roots, maybe. Um, and then uh, it's community, community driven, so anybody can go and start contributing and say hi, what you guys are doing, and whatever. Um, from a governor's standpoint, uh, oh, and by the way, yeah, I, should, I should say it right now. So I'm not part of any of the core contributor. We're gonna employ a core contributor, um, Quentin Le Seller, who's also French, incidentally. Um, and so we've been, you know, on the front of it for a while. So, but I'm, as a disclaimer, I'm not a core contributor and all the slides are actually mostly stolen from other presentations. But, you know, I know, I know a good amount. Um, so yeah, from a governance standpoint, uh, it's fairly simple. Um, they have meetings uh, every week. One week is uh, um, a developer, more developer focused meeting. Another week is more like a governance, more governance focused meeting. Meetings are open, everybody can join. It's on Gitter. I don't know if you get a formula with Gitter, but it's one of the maybe uh, 20 chat apps that you might have seen. Um, it's more sort of GitHub focused. Um, there's a council, which are more people who have been in the project for a while and so are more interested to take decisions and having the decision not being too stupid. Um, so, you know. Um, the governance itself is getting more and more refined. There's more people in the, in the governance um, group and all of that stuff. Uh, everything is in open again, so all the decisions, the finances, and everything. Um, that's word that I've been often used to uh, describe Rin, which you know we've seen in the past few slides. Um, and then so an emission, which is a fairly frequent question. Um, the green emission is one green every second. So the way it works out is there's, there's a block every minute and then there's 60, 60 greens per block. So that's one green per second. Um, yeah, it's kind of scary enough. Uh, um, so it's mined by proof of work. There's a couple of different proof of work algorithm I'll go in there. Um, and then, so everybody is like, well, you know, there's no constant amount of greens inflates forever. Well, not really, actually. Inflation um, goes to zero because, you know, like right now, every new block is 60 grains and there's only two months of blocks passed. So, you know, one more block is actually a fair chunk of it. But five years from now, one more, one more block will be basically nothing. Well, a small drop in the pool of all the grain existing. Um, and yeah, so over, uh, after, uh, eight years is only 33% more green that will have been issued than Bitcoin. Um, and so in overall, you know, even the price fluctuation of say Bitcoin between, I mean, when BlockSide first started, it was $200, uh, it went to 20,000. So it's, it's, overall, it's fairly uh, negligible. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna go, that was more like green the project itself, I'm gonna go into Mimbo-Wimble the protocol. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm gonna start stuff, and that's gonna go more technical, but hopefully not too much. There's only one mathy slide, I think. Uh, so the protocol is a new blockchain design, I was saying earlier. It only describes what the blocks should look like and what the transaction should look like. Uh, it doesn't describe, you know, like tons of other stuff that you have to do to the blockchain, like the proof of work and, um, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer protocol and all that stuff. Um, there is no amount, uh, no script. So, you know, like all the cool scripting you can do with Bitcoin, although, you know, people only use like four or five scripts anyway, but anyway, uh, all the cool scripts you could do with Bitcoin or even with Ethereum where you have all those like fancy programs that you can write and get hacked. Um, there's none of that. Um, there's no addresses. So that we'll see after. Um, there's no, you can't, like all transactions are confidential by default. Uh, so there's no possibility of your transaction to be non-confidential. They are all like that by default. But you can, you know, reveal a little more so that other people can sort of peek if you want to. Um, and the ownership you prove by a single uh, single use key, so um, you can think about it like HD wallet. So you know if you used to HD wallet in Bitcoin, where every single time you make a transaction, it uses a new uh, address. It's kind of the same idea. So if you, you can tell if your address is never reused, there's really no point in addresses. Um, if no one can send twice to the same address and it's enforced by the protocol, then um, there's no real addresses. So yeah, there is no real addresses. So um, the way it works is transactions have to be interactive. So a lot of people, when you see interactive, you think, well, you have to be, you know, always like face to face or online or um, interacting at the same time. It's not really the case. Interactive just means that you have to interact. The timeline or the medium is not dictated by the product protocol at all. So you can do it interactive over email and I can send you like a uh, my part of the transaction, so it's called a slate. I can send you my part of the transaction today, you can reply to me tomorrow, I can fly, finalize next week, it's not a big deal. Um, it could happen, you know, over, so there's one way to do it, uh, which is over like a chat app, where you can just like, you know, exchange it right away. Uh, you can do it by email. Um, you can do it like online through HTTPS as well. Um, so the transaction is done right away. And I'm sure there will be other ways till the early days, you know, like people are developing all sorts of ways to interact. So that's one transaction say where the sender initiates. So if I want to send you some money, right, I initiate, you get my half of it, you complete it with your half, and I finalize the, the whole handshake. It can be, um, down the other way as well, which is more like a, an invoice, where you tell me, hey, you owe me that much, I add my half, and then send it back and you finalize. So that's more like a merchant type interaction. So transaction, um, I don't know how familiar you are with like the uh, Bitcoin transaction shapes. Um, like Ethereum works as accounts. Uh, like, well, who here has heard of inputs and outputs? before I go too much into, okay, half, okay. So um, Ethereum has accounts, which is like a, your bank account that you used to. Bitcoin has inputs and outputs, which are more like the bills in your pocket. So if I have a $5 bill in my pocket and I'm gonna buy an espresso at Blue Bottle, close to here, espresso is $4 because it's San Francisco. Um, I'm gonna give them a $4 bill. So now they have a $4 bill and they're gonna give me back $1, so now I have $1. Bill. So it's still the five dollars, which is in an output, and then I consume it by providing an input, which is like taking it out of my pocket. And then now they have my five dollar output, and they gave me a one dollar output, and I, and I can spend later to buy uh, not much with one dollar. Um, and so this is that sort of um, inputs and outputs are what build transaction in the Bitcoin protocol. Again, Ethereum is different; it's entirely uh, account based. So green is like Bitcoin's inputs and outputs. Um, so yeah, inputs reference all then spend uh, outputs. So um, the five dollar bill I have in my pocket, you know, I haven't spent it yet. I just reference it by taking it out of my pocket. 
Um, and then I, from there, there's two uh, new outputs that are created, the $5 that go to the merchant, and the $1 that goes back to me. And then, um, so in the MIMO, we want MIMO protocol is what's called a kernel that's attached to the transaction, and that's something that you probably haven't heard of unless you're familiar with Green or MIMO Ubo. And it basically, so all the amounts are obscured. So this is sort of the magic part. Um, it uses a form of zero knowledge pools. Uh, and so given that all amounts are obscured, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, that I haven't created money out of thin air, right? Like, um, I could just pretend that I've just sent 10 and actually yeah, I'm sending only two. Or, um, and so the kernels are a way, because all the amounts are obscured, I can't tell. The kernels are a way to, um, to prove that actually the transaction balance. So I haven't spent more than I have, or destroyed. Um, and so the kernels are our way to put this little equation is that you know what comes in the transaction and what goes out the transaction always balances. And um, the excess is the proof that's in the kernel that it all has to be equal to. So it might be, I don't know if I'm very clear, but the math might actually be. Um, so, okay, as I said, everything is obscured. So every single transaction looks the same. Um, there may be a varying number of inputs or outputs, but the outputs all look the same. So if you look at the block explorer, green block explorer, it's not very interesting. Uh, all the outputs just look like a random piece of data and all the inputs look like a random bit of data. So you can say that the block was produced and you know you can have some sort of feeling about how many transactions are in that block, but that's about it. Um, okay, so that's the math, the, um, the math slide. So the transaction in uh, Mibo Wimbo use what's called, well, um, construction called confidential transactions, uh, which was designed um, by Greg Maxwell quite a while ago, actually. And this is, Mimbo Wimbo is a new way to leverage it, basically. So, um, it uses what's called Peterson, Peterson commitments, which are that sort of um, way to hide amounts. So you know you have an amount in, in there, right? Because if I send you money, I have to say I send you like, I don't know, 10, 10 grams. Um, but it's gotta be hidden. So the way to hide it, um, so this uses an elliptic curve, but let's forget about it, elliptic curve for uh, one minute. Say so you have a way to represent my transaction on like an X and Y axis, right? Like uh, your school X and Y axis. So say I'm gonna represent the uh, amount on the X axis and then I make up a number on the Y. And all I give you is a point on that like sort of X, Y axis thing. And if you don't know um, how the point projects trivially, like for some reason there's an infinite number of ways that the point can project back to the axis because I don't give you the orientation, for example, then you can't really find the amount back. So that's the same idea here. You get that other factor, which is the B times G here in the Perdison commitment, that kind of hides the amount and just make it look like some you know, trash data you can't really make any sense of. Um, and again, the nice thing is because I projected my you know, point on a curve, like if I have some, um, all the mass will still work, right? You can still do the same mass of addition and subtraction on the XY curve. All the, like everything you do on the X will work among those points and everything you do on the Y. So all the mass continue to work even if it's somewhat obscured. And then um, because you pick that random point on the Y axis, um, you have a way to prove that it's yours if you need to provide the Y again, right? So again, I, like if I spend like three grains, I'll put three on the X and then I pick a random value on the Y, it doesn't really matter as, as long as we remember it. Well, if I'm forced to produce that Y value again, um, then you know it's me and that I really own that output. So this is a shape of a couple of transactions uh, with some color I did just for illustration purpose. Um, and so those are two regular transactions. You could see exactly the same thing on Bitcoin. Um, and they can be joined together. So they can be 
merged and it actually still works because uh, you know the math still works. Oh, well, I said previously how the inputs minus the outputs, whatever, still works. So you can take the two transaction, pretend it was only only one to start with, and that still works out. Still a valid transaction. And then um, here you can see that, like two things of the same colors, right? Because um, it was my example earlier of giving five dollars to the merchant and they give more, me one dollar back. If I spend my one dollar right away on the pack of string gum, then um, the merchant maybe take the uh, one dollar back. And so there's this sort of one dollar that went to me and back to the merchant is like, there's no point in one dollar getting exchanged. The merchant could have kept it in the, um, in the first place. So that's what this does is like the one dollar is on both sides. And so it can just be eliminated and the massive works, right? If there's a one dollar has moved on out, who cares? You still just add up in the same way. So then you end up with a much slimmer transaction. And similarly in the block, uh, you have a bunch you know, of input outputs that are aware of across multiple transactions. They can be joined together to form a block. And then uh, when the outputs are spent, so you can see there's all like, like similar colors, then they can be removed. And then uh, the block ends up being a lot smaller for it, right? You've removed most of the uh, information that was in there. So that's sort of the second innovation of Mimbo Wimbo um, as a blockchain format. The first one is, you know, privacy. And everything is in the exchange privately and sort of obscure by their own knowledge. And the second one is that sort of scaling that you can remove most of the data all the time. And so you can tell that like, this is just one block. Um, and so we've eliminated that block, but you can be like, well, it's kind of unlikely that, you know, I'll give the merchant will give me my dollar back and I'll spend it right away. Well, it doesn't really matter because if you add all the blocks together since the beginning of time, which is what you do when you download the blockchain, right? You get all the blockchain data since the beginning of time. Well, you get all the blocks and you can do the same thing. You just pretend all the blocks were joined together. Um, and then you can eliminate everything. So all you need to do when you do the initial um, download of the blockchain is you get the block headers, which are just, you know, the main descriptors of what the block is. Um, you get what's called the UTXO set for unspent transactions outputs, which are all the money that has been spent yet, because everything that's been spent before, you know, we were able to eliminate it. Every time, you know, something has been um, used, then it matches something that existed on the chain before, and so everything can be removed. Um, and so all you have remaining is what's called the unspent transaction output, the one that the one you were having in our pocket. And then the kernels, which uh, as I was saying earlier, just proved that there was no inflation, that nobody cheated in the system, nobody um, pretended crashed team transactions out of nowhere. So as a blockchain format, the, um, the advantages and disadvantages of Mimo Webble. So advantages is um, well, so the privacy, right? No amounts, no addresses. Um, I can't say it's you that transacted necessarily because your transaction just looks like any, anybody else's. And I can't really tell what came in, what came out. I can't say, okay, you got one dollar back, hence if you spend one dollar, it's going to be the same dollar, and then, then it comes from you. There's no really amounts to do that. And then they improve scaling because most of the chain data can uh, be removed. So here's is a little caveat. The, um, most of the inputs and outputs can be removed. So the idea is the chain doesn't scale with the number of transactions. Uh, it scales more with the... Um, so you can like transact with yourself 10 times, right? Every input and output will be removed along the way. So all you're left with is always the output at the end. Um, and so everything gets removed. So that's, that's great. So it scales more with kind of the number of users and the number of transactions. The little caveat is the um, kernel. As I told you, you need to... Uh, still be able to prove that the money was created and that needs to stick around. And there are um, like people in the projects are also looking at ways to um, to optimize that and even be able to like mush all the um, kernels all together so that they don't need to be kept around necessarily in the future. Um, so the 
disadvantages are the transaction need to be interactive, as I said earlier. So to beyond that sort of you know transaction with its kernel and it's fully blinded and things like that, um, we need to have a full back and forth, and that makes you know what it, a little more complicated and some sometimes user interaction a little more complicated. Uh, we're only like there's only only been two months since Green was released. Um, there's tons of whatever that are you know maturing right now. I mean. The, there's a few that have been released, more getting released. And so um, we'll see sort of, I don't know, maybe somebody will come up with some really easy and cool way to do that. Um, there's still, on the privacy side, there's still some output linking, so you can trace, like, it's not, you know, there's still some improvement that needs to be made where, um, so if I give you my $5 because uh, uh, I owe you a beer, and then you get the $5 in your pocket, and then uh, after we met, you go and you go get another beer by yourself. Well, I'll probably know because I'll see that you have spent the $5 I, I, told, I gave you. And I, I know it's $5 because I gave it to you, right? Nobody else does. But I do know that you might have spent that $5 right away after because I see it happen on the blockchain again. Because we made that transaction together. And so I know your outputs. So that's you know one thing that's still there. Um, it's only between people transacting. Um, and then another disadvantage is there's no scripting. So you can't do like crazy if they are um, DAO type stuff. But there are um, cleverness with um, uh, cryptography that you can do and that can still uh, enable things like uh, multi-signatures, atomic swap, and possibly um, lightning network. So there's no scripting, but there's still a lot that's possible with the cryptography itself. Um, so I'll go a little bit more in the implementation. So that's sort of the implementation of green for Mimo Wimbo. Hence the I, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Um, okay, so that's a set of um, technology that exists within green. So as I said uh, earlier, um, Mimo Wimbo is just a blockchain format. It doesn't say very much about you know, the detail of even what the signature scheme could be, you know, there's multiple sign signature scheme that you can rely on. Um, there's multiple uh, way to prove different things. So uh, Green had to pick technologies for uh, for all of these and they picked um, that set for various reasons. Um, and so you may have heard of Schnorr signatures that are discussed for adoption into um, to Bitcoin. Uh, you may have heard of bullet proofs, which are, uh, okay, so like just in 30 seconds, because that's getting a little more complicated, but um, if I send you some money, uh, I can pretend, because all the amounts are uh, obscured, I can put a negative amount in there. And then if all you look at is, you know, it sums up, it will still sum up. I can, from five, I can do it, I can create a 10 output and a minus five output, and it will still sum up five in, five out. So you need to attach a proof to every single output to show that the output is positive. Um, and there's multiple of those proofs. The old way to do proofs was really large. Uh, and so there's been a new way to do proofs that are called bullet proofs that come out of Stanford, actually, um, that are uh, much smaller. And so that's what's le leveraging green. Um, then there's uh, scriptless scripts. So that's uh, atomic swap and stuff like that, uh, which, as I was saying earlier, is a way to um, um, sort of embed the scripting in uh, the cryptography and the signatures and the public keys and stuff like that. And then Dandelion, which is an anonymizing protocol so that you know your IP doesn't show anytime you broadcast this transaction, basically. So now the proof of work. Um, the green proof of work, well, the, the basic proof of work itself is called Kaku Cycle. It's based on graph theory. Um, the idea is uh, it's kind of hard when you have a messy graph on the left side. Well, messy graph. When you have like two sets of points and a random sets of um, lines that connect them to find a graph inside that mess on the left hand side. So the way it's, it started is we have two very large set of points and then we're gonna, run down, uh, we're gonna create random edges between them and then go ahead and find a graph. And it can't be any graph, it has to be a graph that's 42 long, that has 42 connections. 
Uh, and that turned out to be pretty hard. Uh, and so, I mean, here is a simple thing, right? Like, even looking at it, you probably have a hard time to find that the graph is on the left side, and I can assure you it was a check. Um, and so, if you have, so in one of the um, green proof of work, like one of these graphs here, it's 2 power 29 points. So that's a lot of points. And then you have half of that are connected. And so it's really hard to figure out where the graph is and what the length of the graph and all of that. So that's the, um, the basic mechanism of the proof of work itself is finding the graph. And it has nothing to do with you know, finding hash functions. So um, yeah, it has not, nothing to do with like running hash functions a billion times or things like that. It's just a complicated graph theory problem. For green, there's two variants of it. There's one that's more optimized to GPUs and one that's more uh, adapted to ASICs. The idea is, uh, you know, when you release a new coin, the ASICs are not gonna appear like right away out of thin air. It kind of takes a while to develop them. And at the beginning, there's not necessarily a market for it. And so it, it allows a slow ramp up. So it start with mostly uh, GPU mining, and then little by little, the share of the blocks that's uh, dedicated to GPUs goes down, and then the share that's dedicated to ASICs goes up. So, and that takes about two years. So, then you know, at the beginning, it's mostly GPUs, and the ecosystem is about two years to you know get their shit together and produce some ASICs. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, after that, maybe. So the the base, the one that's GPU centric uses a lot of memory, and well, they both use a lot of memory, but um, the one that's GPU centric need, uh, requires more, um, and so you can only sort of run that effectively on a GPU versus the um, the one that ASIC centric can be run pretty effectively on smaller memory footprint. And the idea is in an ASIC you can't embed tons of memory; it's very expensive. That's when your, your CPU cache is very small. Right? You don't have gigabytes of CPU cache. Um, so current project focus, um, there was one security audit that was completed before the release for um, mostly the crypto parts. Um, there's another audit that's going on uh, that will be finished in about six weeks. So there's this sort of incremental auditing process that's going on. Um, and then now obviously a lot of people are want to develop stuff like wallets and exchanges and everything so that needs a lot of helping out for all the people involved in the project and then uh, windows support which i think is gonna happen in their next um their next major release okay future rs um so a lot of it is sort of research so you know i'm mentioning it just because it's fun and interesting if you're into that sort of thing, but um, uh, it's still very early stage, it's not there yet, and who knows, maybe it's not gonna land really, but you know. Um, it's at least been mentioned repeatedly, so hopefully it will happen. Um, so fly client is a way to have light client. So okay, um, what I was telling you about, you download the blockchain, you know, it's a whole bunch of data. So first thing you have to download all the headers, and the whole headers have the proof of work. So you really need to use the headers because otherwise I could totally cheat on you and tell you this is my chain and you have to believe me uh, even though I mined it with my laptop, right? So you really have to check the proof of work to say, okay, this has been validated by millions and millions and millions of petaflops or whatever it is. Um, so flat line is a way to say, well, you actually don't need all the headers. You can just, you know, select some randomly and six tank, check out, that's fine. And it turns out you actually don't need that many. And so you can download the blockchain much faster that way. It's especially useful for like clients, like your phone, right? Um, then there's probably gonna be some flavor of uh, lightning because it's possible with the uh, you know fancy cryptographic tricks that you can do with signature and public keys. Um, confidential assets, so... Um, Mimbo Wimbo uses confidential transactions. That's what hides all the amounts, and you know you have no address to use and stuff like that. There's a way to do um, assets with that, uh, still keeping, you know, but you can do assets and random assets. So you could imagine, you know, having 
uh, Ethereum on the uh, uh, green blockchain or things like that. Or you can create you know, your own um, asset if you want to. Universal accumulators are uh, kind of a fancy trick, but I'm not going to get into that. And then uh, BLS signatures are uh, an uh, alternate way to create signatures, also coming from Stanford, Stanford actually. The B stands for Dan Bonnet, who's the uh, cryptographic chair at Stanford. Um, and so would allow to compact all, those, uh, all the kernels. So remember I told you earlier, there's inputs, outputs, kernel, and the kernel will have to remain to show that there's no uh, inflation, and that it can create money else in air. So BLS signatures would allow to still compress all those kernels to a single one and still be able to prove the whole thing, which is kind of cool. Um, so where everything is at now from like a tooling and everything, it's still the early days, you know, it's only two months. Um, uh, two months into Ethereum, it was pretty hard, I can tell you. Um, so of course, my nipples, there's several mining pools, but there's only one that's worth checking. Um, and if the pool is tiny, really tiny. Um, then, um, okay, so there's, there's ton of stuff that have been happening in the last two months. Um, it's actually been somewhat busy. Um, so there's multiple mining software provider, you know, like stuff you will install on your computer and will start mining. So again, if you're a, ga uh, a gamer or you have, you know, graphic card lying around on your desk that you haven't used for a little bit or whatever. Um, there's multiple mining software. Now there's actually optimization that um, allow you to use even graphic cards with lower memory. It's of course not, a, not as efficient, but um, you can still use them and uh, have fun with them. Um, then there's uh, at least three ASICs that we know of that have been announced. Um, so yeah, the, the first, third one is just like a post on Twitter. So, so far we don't really know that much about it, but there's at least a Belisk in InnoCilicon. Um, this is an alternative C++ implementation. There's multiple white projects. Um, there are some, you know, some are more common lines, some are more mobile, some are desktops, some are like Windows only, things like that. Um, and then there's multiple exchanges. The largest one is probably Poloniex. Um, Chain Rift, Chain Rift, Chain Rift, sorry, is also another exchange, and they also released their wallet. Um, so tons of stuff happening. The link at the bottom is all the community projects. There's like a page where everybody can list their things. So if you do one, you can also list one there. Um, so we donated already uh, a little over $25,000 and then uh, half percent of all the reward that comes from Green Mint is donated to the project so that, you know, the developers can pay for their bills and stuff like that. Again, it's not, you know, there hasn't been any ICO, there hasn't been any um, pre-mine or anything like that, actually the first block we are talking with you earlier, that uh, the first block might have been one of the most expensive ones because it took multiple hours of mining to produce it and then you know there were more, so obviously no per mine. Um, so the project kind of needs, you know, still a lot of money to continue and so far um, they've been good at, you know, saying what they're spending, where they're spending it, things like that. And so um, if you have any way to contribute back, I think that'd be um, very welcome. There's a, a funding page, there's a link. And then, um, yeah, so the project is open source. So if you're a developer, I mean, there's, there's actually plenty of roles that they are looking for, um, but it's actual open source. You know, there's no trademark for the green name. Um, as far as, you know, I've seen everybody can come up and start um, proposing some PRs and stuff like that. That's how, uh, so content, the person uh, we hired starting just that way, you know, it was interesting some part of it, started looking at the code, proposed some code, you know, people reviewed it, and then after a while it was accepted, accepted worked on something else, and so on and so forth. So um, it seems, you know, really open. Um, there's again a chat app where everybody seems to hang out, so you can check that out. And yeah, people are actually nice, which, you know, it's a little refreshing. Maybe it's because it's too small and things will go like sideways, like for every other project, but um, so far it's good as long as you don't hang out on Reddit. And then that's about it. So uh, if you have a question, I'll be around.
Um, yeah, we can do a quick Q and A. Is that oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's cool. uh, but you know, hey, thanks so much for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, we're at like. So if you want a question, you raise your hand. While I get the mic, maybe you could start off. The Bitcoin blockchain is like 250 gigs right now. Uh, what is your guess in a couple of years as to how, what, what with pruning and the research, like a reasonable guess, how exactly how big Grin is going to be? Um, it's in a couple of years. I would guess maybe a few gigs. I haven't run the math, so that's kind of a wild well guess. Um, but that would be probably the ballpark. Um, as I mentioned, there's additional um, compression techniques. Oh, I want a couple of gigs, probably. Yeah, um, that would be my guess. But you know, as I said, I was just guessing. Um, I, you know, you can sort of run the mass based on block sizes and things like that. It's also depend on use a lot, right? So if there's, you know, all, only the people in this room that have grains, then it's going to be a lot smaller than if it's half of Earth. So Dimitri de Figueroa here. Um, I'm curious about the multi-sig part of Grin, right? So today, if you, you know, run any sort of like custody solution that you want to be sure that people don't steal money, you need to have multi-sig because of, you know, Quadriga, you know, <laughs> Canadian problems, for example, uh, you, you just need that kind of resistance. What's the story today for, for doing multi-sig in Grin? What's, is there a solution? What, what's the story today? Yeah, so there is a solution. Uh, actually, it's supported with I think it's supported by one of the wallets I mentioned. Um, and the crypto totally allows it. Um, so the transaction still has to be interactive. So, you know, if I want to send money to like all of you, you know, all of the green mean proceeds will go to all of you, then uh, we need to interact. So I need to interact with every one of you. Now, it doesn't need to be in any special order, but there still needs to be this interaction. Uh, it's good that you don't need to be to in interact with each other, right? Um, but so in that, if I interact with each, uh, each one of you, then I can build a transaction that's multi-sig over you know, all of your outputs and you all need to agree. Yeah. So the question is, um, if there's, if I direct it to a multi-sig wallet, do all the parties that hold signatures have to interact? Yes. That's correct. So, uh, yeah. Well, okay. So the term multi sig wallet is a little weird to start with because in general it's not the wallet, but it's multiple people that have keys. But um, um, and then they all have you know their own view of the wallet. Um, but yeah. So basically, you have to interact with each view of the wallet of the multi sig, and then you can produce a multi sig transaction. Um, you know, it's not necessarily more complicated than a single person. Uh, it can be it's totally parallelizable, uh, but you still have the uh, interaction. But the crypto entirely allows it. You know, you can uh, you build all those outputs. You do some like fancy math with the, the signatures, and it produces a standard output that's multi-sig. The nice thing, though, it looks like every single other output. You can't tell that the output is multi-sig. Um, like in other you know, cryptocurrencies, usually like in Ethereum, you'll, tell, you'll be able to tell it's a multi sig contract. Uh, in Bitcoin and all its clones, the first character of your address will be different. Um, in uh, Grin, it, they just look the same. You can't tell any difference. Awesome. Uh, so since Grin has an uncapped emissions rate, um, the significant portion, uh, the block rewards represent a significant portion of the total supply. Uh, and since the mining pools will have to sell Grin to reward their miners with Bitcoin, how do you think that will probably impact the price as an early stage project? Um, I mean, frankly, probably the same as every other cryptocurrency. Um, like uh, Bitcoin, you know, the first four years, I mean, you were start talking about early stage, right? Bitcoin, the first four years was, you know, as far as everyone was concerned, flat um, supply. Ethereum, um, they cut down their reward, I think, at least after a couple of years of uh, starting up. Um, you know, pretty much every single cryptocurrency introduced days for, well, Monero had a very sort of, you know, kind of get rich quick kind of 
get which quick kind of curve. But um, most of the cryptocurrency, like Zcash, um, you know, it's four years also flat. So the first four years is the same. It's not going to change anything. Uh, after eight years, there will be a few more coins. But I was saying earlier on the um, compared to price movement, it's fairly negligible. So from a pool standpoint, we don't see things being any very different compared to any other coin, and I don't, I don't think the supply has any uh, and like a lot of impact on it. The green supply, at least. Hi. Uh, thank you for speaking today. Uh, it's a quick question. Um, what do you think? Do you see any issues or barriers that may impede the success of Grin? And similarly, what do you think is needed to, for Grin to be successful? Uh, I mean, it's a young project, so there's always a lot of barriers. Um, so, I mean, one is. Um, so, as I said, transactions need to be um, interactive. So, there's a couple of things that can be done here. First one is UX, you know. Um, you can, I think you can work UX pretty well to make that not to remove friction. There's some way, it's actually uh, Wait713 is one of them that, uh, that you, you, so it, it still needs to be interactive, but you don't need to be online. And they have so, some sort of little store where you can um, store your intermediary transaction until you know I come online and I pick it up and finalize it and stuff like that. So it works a lot like an email exchange, you know, I could, you send me an email, you know, I'm, I'm sleeping, I'm not gonna get it, in the morning I look at it, oh, I reply, and then you, get, you look at it when you're ready. So, um, so there's a lot of UX that's possible there, you know, everybody's on chat app nowadays, so they're like, hey, are you ready to receive my transaction? Yeah, sure. And uh, you tend to do that also with other cryptocurrency. Again, if, if you use HD anyway, you're gonna want to issue a new uh, address for every, every person that, or well, Bitcoin, HD wallet you're going to want to issue a new um, a new address at every time. So there's, there, I mean, there's some UX work for sure. Um, there's some research work to sort of like, you know, iron out maybe some of the problem. Maybe that interactive problem can be solved also at the cryptography level. I don't know. Um, and then there's um, a funding. You know, there there's not a lot of money. You can tell like, um, we contribute to every time uh, a developer asks for money and stuff like that. But um, some of these campaigns have lasted for a while before they were able to like get some money and not go broke and have to work on something else. Um, so that would probably be the two uh, the two biggest um, issues right now. So to help them, well, and the third one is you know it's an open source project, so money and time is the same thing. Um, and so the third one is contribute. So yeah, that's basically your stream and lovers you can. And you know, working on UX is part of contributing. So really, it's only two: it's contributing to the project where it's needed, and uh, money so that somebody else can contribute for you. Hi, thank you. Could you say uh, something about Beam? Sure. So, uh, so I described Mimbo Wimbo, which is a blockchain protocol, um, which came out. I don't know what I said, but 2016, something like that. Um, and so Green took, uh, I guess, a, a, a two year and a half, well, a little over two years to, um, to release. And then in parallel, there's another uh, implementation that started called Beam. Um, that started last year, I think, and then they, they released just a week or two before Green. Um, so the main difference is they're, they're kind of uh, often mentioned one with the other because they both implement the Mibo Wimbo protocol. But that's basically uh, well, like where it stops. Uh, Beam is a lot more like Zcash in terms of the way it's structured. It's controlled by a single company. They have a um, founder's reward as well. So, you know, uh, in Zcash and Beam, um, actually, I don't know exactly what the share in Beam, but I, I'm assuming it's the same as Zcash, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, for every block, 20% goes to the, the founders, like the company that funded the project. And after that, it's a foundation that's supposed to take over, but that's kind of, you know, every, every block being mined, there's a chunk that's um, going to the company. For the most part, it's only controlled by that company. So, you know, if you come and say, well, I really like Beam, but I wish it supported, you know, whatever, um, they're probably not gonna tell you, oh yeah, let's do it. Um, and so it's, it's a different approach. Um, Green is much more, you know, like, Monero, like 
um, well, Bitcoin was like, you know, Litecoin, like, you know, it's been created out of sort of thin air from um, people who are anonymous as well. So I think the green developers, there's six people, seven people that are the green call team. Um, and two of these are, you know, entirely anonymous, including the project founder, uh, who might pull a set of know. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a very different approach. The base of the blockchain format is the same, but then after that, the standard is different. The proof of work is different. You know, every detail I talked about, except for Mimbo and Ball is different. Um, and again, the sort of ethos and approach is somewhat different. Hey, uh, yep. thanks for the talk. It's good, it was really good, thank you. Uh, so there's an article that came out yesterday called uh, Grin uh, Crypto uh, Currency to Vote Unchanged for the Hard Fork. So I guess every six months there's a upgrade, right? But in this particular upgrade that's coming up in July, um, this is going to be like a vote. Uh, I was wondering if this is going to um, affect the price or affect if there's going to be like a split because you know whenever I hear hard fork, I hear something. You know, it might be a, a yeah. split. So, but I don't think that's what they mean. I, don't, I think I, they, this is more of an upgrade. So uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Is this something to be concerned about uh, with this particular upgrade? So um, in my opinion, and you know, after that, you know, I, I don't know what that fixed price. So maybe, you know, the price will crush after or maybe it'll triple after. I have no clue. But um, the that news doesn't change really anything much. Um, so the hot fork, um, the helpful schedule was, as far as I know, was already planned, you know, sometime last year. And the idea behind it was just to say, well, you know, we might screw up. And also uh, there's, you know, we think we gonna have to, you know, have more like new stuff that's gonna, gonna come up and might not be backward compatible. So there's gonna be this hard work schedule and it's every six months for the first two years. And so, as far as I know, I think this was agreed upon last year. And so that's not changing. Like everybody knew about it last year. Everybody knew about it on the 1st of January. Everybody knew about it on the 15th of January. Everybody knew about it last month. So that's not changing. Um, from my understanding, which, uh, cause I read that article too. Um, what's changing is that, so, and that's getting a little um, subtle. But um, there's two proof of works, right, I mentioned earlier, one for GPUs, one for ASICs. And then this, for the one that's for ASICs, so the one for GPUs, you know, is gonna like sort of go down over two years, and then it's gonna mostly transition to ASICs. The one that's for ASICs, there's some kind of upgrade schedule so that um, new ASICs have to come up regularly. And so that's what's a discussion, is whether that schedule keeps getting enforced and you know, uh, ASIC gets sort of obsolete regularly, or not, or you know, maybe only once, and then after that, it just stays that way. Um, and so, practically, um, I don't think this. I mean, especially it's like far away, right? It's, I think the first sort of plan obsolescence I'm talking about. I think the first one is at least a year, ago, a year um, in a year. And then the next one is, you know, even further. So, um, well, A, this time, and B, you know, it's just discussion on what's going to happen in two years. So, you know, there's plenty of time for every market to sort of factor all that in. And, but I, I mean, I think it's, it's as, well, for miners, it can be, especially for ASIC miner, um, the people who are making the ASICs, like if you're Obelisk and Inel Silicon, it's material. It's material. Um, or like Bitmain, if they ever decide to do an ASIC or whatever. But for individual miners, you know, well, large scale miners it might be material because they might need, might need to renew all their hardware regularly. But you as, you know, me as a user or whatever, even in GreenMeet, I don't really care. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think it's gonna have a lot of impact. Hey, thanks for the talk. Is there currently a difficult difficulty adjustment to the cuckoo cycle algorithm to like make it more or less difficult depending on how quickly blocks are happening or you like add points or add edges required? Yeah, so, okay. Um, so there is a difficulty like, you know, in every single other coin you're used to. 
um, the idea is that so you have the it's it's the same as uh, at the other so uh, hash cache right you hash repeatedly until you find enough zeros at the beginning of your block basically so cuckoo cycle is the base and then uh, you're forced to do multiple cuckoo cycle rounds repeatedly uh, to match a given difficulty so it's kind of a combination um, and so there is a difficulty that changes with every block um, that's calculated up over you know whether blocks have been happening too fast or too slowly and actually even a factor that goes into it too because you know as I said there's two proof of works so say um, all of a sudden there's like tons of ASICs that come on the market well you don't want to have the, the ratio between the GPUs and the ASICs vary too much because it's pre-agreed right like so if it's supposed to be 50 50 well it's gonna say stay 50 50 even if the ASICs double so there's some kind of ratio in between two that adjusts with every block as well is there any particular reason uh, cuckoo cycle over hashing? Um, that I wouldn't necessarily know much because you know I wasn't there uh, at, the <laughs> at the beginning. You'd have to probably ask the early developers. Um, you know, my guess is that when you release a new coin, you can't necessarily. So it's dangerous to say I'm going to start a new coin. It's going to use SHA 250 C caching because um, then you have all those SHA 250 C hasher out there, and you can get you know attacked every day and if people are bored mining on Bitcoin Cash then they'll attack you or Bitcoin Gold or whatever it is. Um, so it's kind of dangerous to use a, uh, an algorithm for which is already a large amount of hash power. So I guess you know um, Zcash came, with, came up with Equihash which was also brand new. So I guess same idea here. Yeah so it's mostly security. Um, I mean it has some impact on like the mining landscape like um, Cuckoo is somewhat memory hard, so it requires a fair amount of memory, um, which lends itself more to, you know, a blend GPU ASICs, but then, you know, it can adapt it. It's, it's, um, it's fairly um, adaptable, so I guess that's, that's a good part about it, too. So, one more question? Yeah, last one here. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Uh, thank thank you for the talk. Um, I'm curious about one of the more unique things about this, which is the wallet. Um, could you kind of expound a little bit about how the information gets stored on on a client? Because it, th th there are private keys involved, but it's not like you're storing one private key per wallet for, for an account. Yeah, could you just like talk a little bit about how that works? Okay, um, so it is actually still just a private key. Um, the problem is, so, okay. So you have your private key, um, and we'll take, I don't know, um, Litecoin. You have your Litecoin private key, and you want to say, what's my balance, right? So from your, that private key, you can directly calculate your, uh, your address, and then you get uh, services like ours that you know, index the whole blockchain for all the addresses that are in there. And so you can directly look it up, and we'll tell you, here is the balance, and here are the um, list of transactions. And that's why you can, you know, look up your transaction really easily. And nowadays, commoditized that you know you have services that scan the blockchain and look for all addresses and whatever. Um, the problem is, um, people like us, we can't scan um, the green blockchain, right? It's all like it all looks like random data to us. We have no idea whether it's your output or not. And so the only way to know whether it's your output or not is to have your private key, uh, which obviously you wouldn't give me, maybe. <laughs> um, and so. You gotta uh, resort to other uh, mechanisms. So uh, you can still have your wallet scan the whole blockchain for you and try to spot which outputs belong to you, and that will work. And so even if you lost your whole wallet, um, and but you saved your private key as a good person and you buried it on your back backyard, then you can dig a hole again, get your wallet out, and you know recreate it. Um, the thing is, it's kind of an expensive process, as I was saying, because you need to rescan the whole blockchain. Um, it's not super expensive. I mean, the chain right now is not super big, but I've done it multiple times. It's like, you know, a minute, two minutes, actually less than that, I think. Um, when the blockchain is like, you know, millions, of billions of blocks, it's probably going to be longer. But, you know, if you lost everything, then you can wait a little bit for it to restore. And because it's an ex expensive process, then the way it stores 
data about your transactions so that you can look it up quickly. So when you start your wallet, you know it has a little database and we'll say, okay, this, we already know this is his output, there's no point in looking again. And here where the amounts um, transacted and whatever. And so it's become the wallet's responsibility to track your transaction and not everybody can try your tra transactions for you. So that's kind of the, you know, the trade-offs. But then um, once you have that mechanic in place, then it's somewhat easy. It's the same, you know, you have a database with amounts and stuff and it's confirmed by the blockchain and you can check that it's confirmed and refresh it when your output happens and stuff like that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. you know, yeah. I, sh I completely forgot I had a green shirt on under my sweater. Um, so there's still pizza, there's still drinks in the back. Um, you hang out, talk, you know, discuss the ideas. If you get a chance to stack your chair, that'd be really helpful. Uh, the closer you stack them to those doors over there, just against the wall,